write Go code for production work. Uh, but it is new enough to me that I'm still learning a lot on a regular basis. Uh, and I'm actually hoping that the fact that it's still fresh to me and I'm still in that frame of mind will be helpful in giving this talk and helpful for those of you who are being introduced to it for the first time. So feel free to post questions, just shout out questions as we're going through, uh, and hopefully I will be able to answer them, but I, you might be able to stump me. Uh, so just as a warning to that. Uh, what I'm going to do in this talk is comparative examples. Uh, I find it really helpful when you're learning a new programming language to see a side-by-side -side example with a programming language that you already know. Uh, JavaScript is a very popular language for all of its good and all of its bad, and so I decided to pick that one as the comparative language. So most of this talk, we're just going to be going through examples of Go code uh, and, JavaScript, and the comparable stuff in JavaScript, uh, and that'll be basically the structure. There are a lot of things that this talk is not. And one of them is it's not go versus no. Like, this isn't a battle of supremacy. I'm not going to be like, oh, and look at how bad this is and how good this is uh, as we go through. I'm really trying to use one language to bootstrap your knowledge of another. Uh, it's, uh, I, some of the stuff that I will do in JavaScript, I will write it in slightly more of a, a go-like way than you could write it in JavaScript. Uh, and so I'm sure there will be some aficionados of JavaScript out there be like, I can, you know, I can do that better. You should be writing it this way. So just FYI, I've tried to make some decisions on that just to make it clearer to do the A-B comparison. So not a battle for supremacy. The other thing is I'm going to stick to core packages only. Uh, I don't want it to turn into like, hey, look at this really awesome CM <coughs> package. Look at this really awesome Go package. Look at how they do whatever. Uh, I want you to get a sense of kind of the core language elements of Go and how they compare to JavaScript Node. So I will make a caveat that in one case there is something that Go has that, that uh, JavaScript is not, so I have to use a package for break that rule once today. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to stick with the very fundamental core package. So getting directly into Go. Uh, Go is often described like C and Python having a kid, and it inherited the good looks and pleasant demeanor of Python with the confidence and athletic ability of C. Uh, that's a pretty common way to describe it. Uh, another common one is C for the 21st century, although the people that have created Go really don't like it to be called this for whatever reason. Uh, another one is that it's a melting pot for good ideas. Uh, it's really taken a lot of what people have liked and are finding useful uh, elements that make good patterns and stuff from a number of different languages and kind of synthesized those uh, into a new language. Go is a very new language, uh, and it's exciting for those reasons because they were able to start from basically scratch. I won't say perfectly scratch because you can see kind of they've got a C background, so there's some baggage I think from C. But you know they incorporated a lot of really good stuff that people are using now as opposed to having to live with since <coughs> uh, the Stone Age program. Uh, so Go in a nutshell, it is a statically typed language. It is compiled. Uh, it's in the C Java syntax family. You're going to see brackets. You're going to see a lot of things that look familiar. Uh, it has functional capabilities. It has both closures and first class functions, functions and variables. It does have pointers, which scares a lot of people. But I would say they are very simplified compared to C. They do not suck nearly as much as they do in C language. Uh, and then one of the big things about it is it has con concurrency primitives. It has these things called Go routines, which we'll get into later in the talk which make concurrent, simultaneous programming uh, much easier. So right now, we're just going to start the examples. Uh, and I'm going to be pacing a lot in this talk, because for whatever reason, they designed this room so if you're in front of this, you're in front of the screen. And so I'm going to try to move out of your way as much as possible. So I apologize for that. Um, during these examples, Please shout out if you have a question. If I'm going too fast, if something goes on, you don't understand, I don't want to leave you behind because we're going to keep building and building and building all the way through. Uh, I don't want it to be like I didn't understand something at the beginning and then the whole rest of the talk was useless, right? So I not only encourage you, I implore you to ask questions if something doesn't make sense. Um, but other than that, we'll just get into the examples. I have live code for each of these examples. We're going to be walking through them. Go is going to be on the top half of the screen, JavaScript is going to be on the bottom half of the screen through all of these examples. 
Um, we're going to be walking through essentially by coding each one. The screen's a little low. I'm sorry if you have trouble seeing the JavaScript. Again, if you need anything, you know, we need to stop at anything to take a look or whatever, just let me know. Um, but that's basically how we're going to go through it. So the first example, the first example is always a hello world example. So we'll open that up. And we have Go on the top here, JavaScript on the bottom. And I apologize, the screen resolution is a little low, so we'll also see how much code I can get on here at once. Uh, so we start out with, in any Go application, you have to have, um, you have to define a package at the top of your Go application. Uh, and it has to be the package main if that's going to be a, uh, an application you compile. Uh, libraries can have other names, so if you wanted to create a library for making paths, you could call it package path, and that would be the path library. Uh, but that would be a library as opposed to an application. So in Go, you have to start every application with package main. That's how the, comp the compiler is going to find the file in which to open and find the entry. You also then have to define a main function. Uh, it's not like JavaScript where you can just start scripting at the top level of the, f of the file. You actually have to say this is where the, this is where the program begins. Uh, and everything will begin there in the function main. So when I'm doing JavaScript examples today, I will be doing the same kind of style just for the AB in comparison here. So in JavaScript, I'll just create a main function and keep everything localized and we do variable definitions and that kind of stuff. Uh, so that it looks the same. So in JavaScript, I have function main, and then I just call, I just call it so they can act as like the entry point when you run it in Go. Okay. So we have our function main. This is our boilerplate, and we want to define a hello world function, and we do that in JavaScript. So function hello world, and then we launch the console our hello world. We want to do the exact same thing in Go. Oh, sorry. We call it obviously in our main function, and then we get hello world. Uh, we want to do the exact same thing in Go. We're going to define a function here. Similar keyword, func versus function. You're going to see the syntax is very similar. It is that C Java style syntax. Um, however, right off the bat, we're going to have to import a package in order to be able to write to the console. Uh, Go has a lot less that's imported at the beginning. You have to import it yourself. It doesn't carry kind of the baggage that the browsers brought to JavaScript in terms of like having consoles and all that stuff for logging. Uh, so you kind of have to start from the very beginning, pulling in the packages you want. The FMT package, the format package, is for formatting things into strings, uh, and then printing those to files or uh, console or whatever. So we then use that format uh, package that we've imported, and we use the print line function to print hello world, and we have hello world. We can then call that in our main function the same way you do in JavaScript, and you get hello world out. Uh, the biggest difference you should see right now is that there are no semicolons at the end of lines. Uh, the Go developers were very specific that semicolons were for compilers, not for humans. Uh, and that's so we should just remove them and the compiler should be smart enough to figure it out. Uh, but that's really, the syntax is very similar at the base level. So let's do something a little more interesting, and I hope you can see this in the back. Uh, because the JavaScript's low. We're going to define a function called hello2, and this time we're going to take in a name. And we're going to log to the console hello plus the name, concatenating the string to name. Uh, and then we can run that in our main, call it and run it in our main function. And we get hello Gaia. Uh, to do the same thing in Go, we encounter one of the first differences, which is that Go is strongly typed. So every variable comes with its type. When you define a variable here in the argument list, you have to define what the variables call and always after it, what type of variable it is. So we're going to pass in a string. We can then do format print line, and we can concatenate one string to another the same way. It looks very simple, similar to the JavaScript code. We can then call it on our command line, or call it on our main function, and get hello guy back for Go. So very similar, you just have to start adding types. Let's get a little more interesting. We'll do hello to many in JavaScript. Now, I'm going to use the arguments here, so I'm not going to pass in uh, an array or a set number of arguments. I want to be able to say hello to as many people as I want, one argument right after the other. So in JavaScript, you're going to use the built-in arguments object, which exists inside of each function. 
Uh, and I need to turn that into array, an array because I want to join that into a string. And the arguments object isn't actually an array. It has no join function attached to it. So I use the array prototype to basically turn arguments into an array. And now I have this args object, uh, which I can then log to the console with a join function and a comma separated. So that's what it looks like in JavaScript. We can then call that. And we do hello to many. And we get hello to the number of arguments back as a comma separated list. Uh, to do the same thing in Go, we have an ellipsis operator. So I've gone from name to names. The string is still the same type. This ellipsis operator was added before the type. It's a prefix for the type, dot, dot, string, dot, 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 string, which basically says that I want an undetermined number of strings as an array. And then I want to print those, um, but again, not as many things come in the imported in immediately in Go, you're going to have to use the strings package to do the same kind of join that you would do normally in JavaScript right on the array function. So we'll import strings, and then we can use the strings.join function to join those names with a comma separated list. We can print that, and we get the same result. A couple more. Let's do hello int. Uh, this time we're going to pass in a value. It's going to be an integer. Uh, and then we will log that. So we hello plus some integer. We'll send in 12. And we get back hello 12. In JavaScript, this is very easily done because JavaScript will do type conversion for you. Uh, in a statically typed system like Go, uh, you're going to be passing in now an int. And you can't just concatenate a string and an int together. Uh, it doesn't do automatic type conversion. So we're first going to switch from print line to print f, uh, which is a slightly different function. Uh, it basically says formatted printing. So we get a little bit more control over how that string is going to be printed. One of the downsides or one of the things you need to be careful of is that you actually have to add the line ending to the end of a formatted printed string. It'll print whatever. Uh, so if you don't include that, it'll just keep going on on that same line that you printed on before which can be good, can be useful, uh, but in our case we want, uh, we want essentially the same kind of behavior we had before. Then we'll use what's called an escape string. Actually, I'm going to... Uh, we'll use an escape, escape character, uh, uh, the percent sign V, sorry, which is basically say, I want an added, I want a value put in that string. Uh, and then I take my value and I put it in as the second argument and that value will then go take that value, convert it to a string based on whatever type of value it is and stick it in there. So the percent sign V is an easy way to do that. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the, you can format it as floats and that kind of stuff and we'll get into some of that later. Um, but the percent V is available for every type in Go which makes it pretty easy to use this function the same way you would use kind of the console log behavior. So then we call hello int and we get that back. Uh, let's extend on that type situation a little bit more by doing hello multiply. Uh, and we're going to pass in multiple arguments now, a multiplier and a value. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to multiply those two together and then print them to the uh, screen. And so we have multiplier times value and we just concatenate that on. Again, JavaScript just turns everything into a string uh, and logs it to the console for us. But I want a little bit more control over how that's displayed because I can send in a number that has a lot of decimal places after it. So JavaScript has the to fixed function attached to strings or to uh, uh, numbers, which will turn them into a string of a fixed format. And so I'm going to put eight digits after that one. And then I'm going to call hello multiply and get my result. To do the same thing in Go, I now have multiple arguments that are of different types. I want my multiplier to be an integer, but my value is going to be a float. It's going to be a floating point number. Uh, so I'm going to take this same printf function, and I'm going to start out with this form. And I want to multiply those two together. So what you do is that, normally. Uh, but that's actually not going to work. And the reason is, 
Uh, the same thing we had before is Go does not do type conversion. It doesn't do any type of automatic type conversion. Uh, it, and now, reason for that is that you get speed out as a result. Uh, if the programmer is responsible for doing type conversion, then every time you call something, the, the compiler, the runtime, or whatever it is, doesn't have to check. Uh, and so you get a lot of speed performance improvements based on that. So it's a little frustrating at first, but that's part of what gives you this speed advantage. So I have to turn the int multiplier into a float64 in order to multiply that float64 value. They've got to be the same type of <coughs> multiplication. Uh, otherwise, you get a compile error. Then in this case, I want that two fixed notation, same thing that I had in the JavaScript case. I use the percent sign dot af to turn it into that form. Uh, you can look these up online. They're, they're, they're common, just the ways you go. If you're not really worried about it, just keep using uh, percent %v. Uh, and you'll be able to do that with just about everything. I can then call that and get the same result. Okay. So that ends the Hello World example. Any questions on that one? Is the 64 part of float 64 important? That yeah, it is. They're, so they, they don't have just a float. They've got float 32, float 64, so you want to specify a size. Basically just use float 64 unless you have a reason to use something else. Uh, the, int, the int form here, I don't know why they have an int because they also have an int 64 and an int 32. Uh, but they recommend using the int, but then for floats they don't have the same equivalent. So, uh, you know, most stuff is 64 bit these days. So they recommend, unless, unless you have to enforce that, they would like them to do a decision. So that's just kind of the way they... Yeah? With their strict not type conversion, if you were to just pass in 3 instead of 3.75 and expecting a float, will it interpret that as 3.0 or will it throw an error? It will, it, in this case, in what I did, it will interpret it as an int because you put it as an argument into a function, and the way it figured out what that should be is it said, oh, you're passing it into a function that's expecting an int, so I'll turn that into an int, or if it's expecting it in a float, it will turn it into a float. Um, but we will come up against issues where that's a little bit more ambiguous later on. Yes. Anything else? All right, we made it through Hello World. Let's get a little bit more fun. <laughs> now we're going to look at variables and functions. Uh, something that's very easy in JavaScript has a little bit of a catch in Go. So we again start with our boilerplate. I'm going to start everything with the boilerplate. We're having trouble showing all this stuff on here, but you can see package main at the top. I've already imported format because we're going to be printing stuff out for the rest of the day. So you see that for all the rest of the examples. And then I've got the boilerplate main function so that when I compile the Go application, it knows where to go. So, defining a variable in JavaScript, you can do it two different ways. You can do it without initialization, <coughs> it initializing the value, or you can initialize the value. Uh, those are basically your two options. Uh, and then if we log those two variables to the console, you'll see the first one is undefined, because we haven't given it anything to define it with, and then the second one, in this case, is 12. Uh, in Go, there are multiple different ways to define uh, variables. So the first one is the uninitialized form, like this. Where you say variable x1, and then you have the type after it. So very similar, but you've got to always specify a type. And so we'll call this one an int. There's the second option, which is the same as the JavaScript one, where you can define it as an int, and then you set it equal to something, and it's initialized. There's also a third form where you can skip the type as long as you assign it a value that the compiler can figure out what type it is. So in your case here, that sees it as an int. Uh, if you wanted this to be a float, you'd need to do put a dot zero after it to let it know that it was going to be a floating point number. Uh, the compiler will just assume what it is. When you, run the, when you run the compiler, it runs very quickly and it will very quickly tell you that there's a problem. It won't let you compile it, so you'll know very quickly if it's an issue like that. But um, that is a problem. And then Go has this short declaration syntax, which basically removes the var keyword uh, and removes the type. <coughs> and you just have to assign some variable to some value. Uh, this is the most popular type of declaration you'll see in Go code. I will be using this almost exclusively for the rest of the day. Uh, and it's just because 
uh, there's no reason to keep specifying what it is if the compiler can very easily figure out what it is. Uh, so unless you have to do something that's not initialized at the beginning, uh, then you can initialize it and set the value at the same time. Though it's not like JavaScript where the best practice is to define all your variables at the top and then use them in the function, you can define them inside of loops, you can define them anywhere you want. So uh, defining stuff that is uninitialized is much less common. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of this type of behavior for defining variables. So then we print this to the console and we get something that's very different than JavaScript. We didn't initialize that first variable x1, but we didn't get an undefined, we didn't get a null, we didn't get a nil, we didn't get a none, we didn't get any of those kinds of things. We got zero. Uh, and so what Go does is there's no such thing as an uninitialized uh, variable. Every variable is initialized to what they call its zero type. Uh, so in this case, we said x1 is of type int, and so we didn't give it a value, so it initialized it to a value of zero. Uh, part of the reason Go does this is that another one of the problems with performance is uh, null checking. Uh, whenever you go into a function, is this null, is this null, is this null? And so it tries to eliminate those cases by always initializing uh, variables to their default zero false type behavior. Uh, and this gets really important as you start building data structures and that kind of stuff because everything becomes initialized. So just to expand on that for a second, uh, let's define four uninitialized variables in JavaScript and we print those to the console and you get undefined every single time, right? I mean, that's pretty boring. Um, in Go, we're going to give each one of those a different type. So one's a string, one's a boolean, one's an int, one's a float. And then we're going to print those and you'll see you get an empty string for the string type, you get false for booleans, you get a zero integer, and you get a zero float back. So it's pretty easy to tell what you're going to get, but you just need to remember that it's going to be initialized. So you can't just you can't do like undefined checks or null checks in the same type of way. It's going to have uh, it's going to have a value even if it's zero. So now let's create a function. We're going to call it make indexer, uh, and we're going to use this function to explore closures a little bit. We'll do the same thing in Go. We'll create that make indexer function. And in both cases, we're going to set some value, starting value equal to zero. This is the same as if I had said var value int equals zero, but I just put a zero here, so this basically is just saying compiler figured out. It's obvious from that value what it is. Then I'm going to define this increment function that increments value by one and returns that incremented value. And I'll do the same thing in Go. I'll create that increment function. I haven't returned anything yet. And the reason is in Go, you have to, it's again, it's a type, static type language. So when you return something in a function, you need to include in the function, function signature what is being returned. So in this case, I want to return an integer. So I have to specify after the function definition what's being returned. So an int is being returned, and now I can return that value. Then down at the bottom here in the JavaScript, I'm going to return that increment function. So I've created a closure with make indexer that is going to return a function uh, that every time I call that function, it will, it will increase the value by one and then return that value as a result. I want to do the same thing in Go. I'm going to return increment. This is a function. I have to specify the type of return in Go. And so the make indexer function returns a function that returns an int. Uh, much more static in its typing. You have to be very specific about that. But then I can return the increment function here, which I define the same way you do in JavaScript. So then I create an indexer with my make indexer function. I do the same thing in Go. Again, I can use the shorthand notation because the function I defined above, the make indexer function, tells me what the return type is, so it tells the compiler what the return type is. So the compiler already knows what indexer is. I don't have to specify it again. And then I can log in the JavaScript side, indexer, and then I can call the function three times. And the result I get is indexer one, two, three. 
right? And so familiar with JavaScript, you're familiar with closures. That closure value that we defined above uh, persists with the function that's returned. So it, it can hold that state. We can do the same thing in Go, and we get the same result. So Go supports closures in the same way that JavaScript does, which is really, really handy. So those are variables and functions. That's variables and functions. So now we're going to move on to more complex data types, and we're going to look at arrays. Again, I start with the boilerplate code for Go and the same structure in JavaScript. And I'm going to create an array in JavaScript with three names in it, the three musketeers. I want, to, I want to do the same thing in Go. I'm going to say array dot e or colon equals because I'm going to give it a type already by definition. <coughs> I have to specify its length if it's going to be an array. So I've got to tell if it's going to be three elements. Then I've got to tell you what the, I've got to tell the compiler what type of elements are going to be in that array. And then I can initialize those values. So again, initialize to the three musketeers. Uh, <coughs> we're going to get into the issues of a fixed size array in a second, but just so you know, arrays in Go have to have a specific size. Yeah? Um, and all variable types have to be the same? Yeah, so you, well, there are tricks to getting around that um, because, well, I'll, I'll show you the trick later. So there is a trick to get around that, but you, want to be careful when you do it. So in this case, I've said string, so yes, all of them have to be of type string. If you put something in there that is not a string, you'll get a compiler. <clears throat> Any other questions? Keep them coming. So yes, that absolutely has to match the type. So then we're going to create a function in JavaScript called modify array, and I'm going to take the three musketeers and pass that array in and replace them with the three stooges. To do the same thing in Go, I start with that function. I've got to pass in the array, right? I have to put in the exact same type in Go. I have to say that it's a three length string array. Then I could do the same thing, but I have to specify the length too. I can't just say it's an array and it happens to be a three. Uh, it's very specific about that. An array of length four and an array of length three are actually different types, even if they're both three string or four string arrays. Um, this, is a, this is a specific type. So then in JavaScript, I call modify array on the array we created. I log that to the console, and the three musketeers have been replaced by the three stooges names. I'm going to do the same thing in Go. I'm going to call modify array, and I'm going to print it to the console but nothing changed. The three musketeers names survived. The reason for that is that arrays in Go are passed by copy, not by reference. Uh, if that seems weird to you, um, and from the JavaScript side, if you pass in a variable that is an integer or a number into a variable, and then you change that number's value, it doesn't change the number outside the function, right? The number was copied into the function. Any modifications you do and reassignment you do stays within that function. When you copy by reference or pass by reference, sorry, pass by reference, not copy by reference. If you pass by reference, you're actually passing a reference to the object so that inside the function you can modify that object. And that's what happens in JavaScript inside of arrays. Um, if you pass an array in JavaScript, it gets modified, it's a reference to that array. That array gets modified. You see those changes, those modifications outside of the array. Uh, that doesn't happen in Go. It's copied, just like a number is. Uh, so we want to get around this because this can be useful. But it can be a really big pain. So I'm going to define another array down here in JavaScript called slice. 
I'm going to define something called a slice. I'm going to call the slice here in Go. I'm not going to specify the length. And this is a crucial difference. This is no longer an array. It's a completely different type of object called a slice. <coughs> and a slice in Go acts much more like an array does in JavaScript. Uh, and most of the programming you would do in Go is actually done with slices as opposed to arrays. So we're going to explore that, but the key things here are that I'm not defining anything at the beginning, and I'm not specifying a length. So what I can do is what I would normally do in JavaScript where I push on a couple of values to create my, my array, I can do a similar type thing. Oh, sorry, I'm in the printed console, obviously. Um, I can do the same thing in Go, where I can append values onto that slice. One of the key differences here, though, is that the append function returns a new slice. Every time you append something on, you're returning a new slice. Because the, the slice is really just a reference. So it's not like it has to copy all of the values in memory or whatever. Um, so all of these slice functions will return new slices. So I pass in the orange slice, I get the blue one, then the green one, and finally I end up with the pink one. I can then print that to the console, and I get something that looks very similar to what I had in JavaScript. I can now create a modify slice function, which behaves just like our modify array function, except for this argument here is a slice. It's a string slice as opposed to a string array. And now I can call that. In the console, and I got it to change. Slices pass by reference the same way arrays do in JavaScript. So the slice is what you use most of the time. The array, the array itself, that fixed type array, is really good for um, like transformation matrices, 3D graphics, that kind of stuff, where you know the size. It's very fixed. Um, maybe you want to be passing matrices around, but you don't want to lose. Um, references to and that kind of stuff. It's a different type of object than what you're used to using in JavaScript. Uh, but you get around that just by using slices. So we're going to redefine this slice now to have the colors of the rainbow. We're going to do a little Roy G. Biv here. Um, and I'll do the same thing here in Go. Slices I can initialize values for. So I've initialized it. A slice with these, these values. And then what I want to do is in JavaScript, if I want to get a subset of that, a slice of the array, I would use the slice function. And so I can get slice element 2 to element 5. That'll give me three elements, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, the slice notation in Go is the slice index form, which if you know Python, or there's a couple other languages that use that as well. Um, it's just simply this. This will return a new slice of uh, elements 2 to 5, so 2, 3, and 4. I log those to the console, and I get yellow, green, and blue out of my array slash slice. Now what I want to do is I want to call modify array on that slice in JavaScript. So I've taken this slice, Roy G. Biv, I'm going to create a slice out of that and call modify array. And then I'm going to log that to the console, the original array. <coughs> Nothing changes, right? Because when you create that slice, it essentially created a new array in JavaScript with those values, populated with those values. So I changed some array I've not defined. So the original array here, this, this slice array I have, remains unchanged. However, in Go, if I do the same thing, the values change. Slices are essentially wrappers around arrays. And they're actually the same thing in JavaScript. But you don't see what's going on behind the scenes in JavaScript. You get to ignore that. Um, if you append to uh, an array in JavaScript, in the background, it creates this new array underneath, appends it to the memory, does all of that stuff. And then that lives by itself, right? That array is it's connected to that variable again. It's all this one entity. Um, 
in, in Go, slices can share arrays, in which case this has done uh, in this example. You, I've created a new slice here, but that slice didn't create a new array. It didn't actually copy anything in memory. It's a very cheap operation to create a new slice because nothing happened. All it says is I'm now pointing to this part of the array. <coughs> So you have to be careful when you're doing this type of stuff in Go versus JavaScript that you're very explicit in terms of um, creating new arrays uh, and new slices and where it is and, and whatever because slices share their underlying array. So we can go back to the beginning here where we created that array like a three and populate it with values. If I want to turn an array into a slice or to get a slice from array, an array essentially, I just say this variable and I use the slice notation with nothing in between, right? Which basically says from the beginning to the end. And then what you get out is a slice. So I can then call modify slice on this. And it changed the values of array. Now when I print the array here, I've actually modified that, the original values of that array. Because a slice just points to an array. That's all it does. If you don't initialize the array yourself, or if you don't create a slice from an array, Go does that behind the scenes for you. But that's really what's going on here. So really the moral of this story is you've got to be careful in Go to not use arrays quite the same ways and slices quite the same ways that you would do in JavaScript because you would get bitten. So now we're going to look at maps and objects, which is the other built-in data type uh, in Go and JavaScript. Start again with our boilerplate main function. And I'm going to create an object M1 inside of JavaScript. And I'm going to fill it with A, B, and C set equal to 12, 22, and 8. I've just got an object. I'm going to do the same thing in Go. And in Go, they're not called objects, they're called maps. A map is a hash, uh, maps keys to values. So I'm going to create a map. I have to tell the compiler what type of keys you have. So it's going to be a map. The keys are going to be strings. And you have to tell it what type of values they're going to be as well. So this is going to be a map with keys of strings and values of ints, which is much less flexible than the JavaScript object. Again, there is no automatic type conversion. Everything's <coughs> strict. But then after that, I can define my a, b, and c, little 12, 22, and 8, just like I did in JavaScript. I can then log that to the console, add the three together, and get the answer to life, the universe, and everything, which you can't even see on this resolution screen. That's 42 if you didn't know. <laughs> you can do the same thing here, and you can print the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Uh, same kind of notation. Again, in JavaScript, you could just do dots, but. Uh, both of these work same way both in both languages. So now we're going to create what you're going to see more often in JavaScript, which is an object of mixed types. Uh, a is 1, B is true, and C is hello. So we've got a string, an integer, and a boolean. And we want to do the same thing in Go, because it would be really obnoxious not to be able to do that. So we're going to create a map. The keys are still going to be strings. And in Go, the keys can be basically anything you want, which is much more powerful than JavaScript. We'll stick with string today. And then I'm going to use this the interface with the curly bra brackets after them, which is the Go, basically the Go version of anything. So back to your question earlier, if you want to get around the type system at any point in time, everything is an interface, an empty interface is what that's called. That's basically Go's generic. It doesn't actually have a generic, but that, that's its most generic type, and everything will fit into that. So. Now that I've basically said I'll take anything, I can fill it with one true hello, and there we go. That will compile. 
I'm then going to create a function to modify those values so that they go from one true hello to two false goodbye. I'll do the same thing in Go. I have to pass in the type. It'll be a map string. Again, the empty interface type. I don't want to be able to use whatever. And I can set the map to two false goodbye. I'll then modify those values and print it to the console. And in JavaScript, I get two false goodbye. In Go, I also get two false goodbye. Object pass, objects passed by reference just like JavaScript. Sanity <coughs> is preserved. Can you nest maps? You can nest maps. It gets a bit ugly if yeah, you're defining it. Hairy. Yeah, it actually is. Uh, Go is much better at strong typing, so it has a different structure that JavaScript doesn't have, which we'll get into very shortly, which is how you really want to do that. Uh, there are cases, though, when you want to nest maps, was the question, can you nest maps? Um, so maps inside of maps inside of maps, if you want to define that. There are actually websites uh, where you can basically say, I want it to look like this, and it will write that code for you, so that you don't have to do <laughs> So if you really, really want to get around the type system and just do that, you can get away with it. Um, but I, it wouldn't be considered good go. <laughs> so basically, what you can do to get around this is in JavaScript, you can create a constructor object, uh, which, which defines an object that has specific values. So I'm going to create this example constructor for an example class. That's not a class, class ish. Um, setting A, B, and C, and using this, this keyword inside the constructor. And now I have kind of a pseudo object that is structured, a structured data thing. I can do the same thing in Go, but I use type example struct. And this basically says, I want to create a new type. I want that type to be of example. And it's going to be a struct, a structure. It's going to be a data structure. And then I can specify inside that what the fields are going to be. A is going to be an int, B is going to be a boolean, and C is going to be a string. I can then create a new one of the example down below in JavaScript with the new keyword and set it to one true hello. I can create a new structure of type example up here in Go and set it to one true hello. In JavaScript, I can just call modify values on that same thing because it's everything's untyped and they both have A, B, and C, but inside of Go, I actually have to create a modify struct function that takes in my new type, which is example. Right? Example is now a type in my application. I've created that new type that has that new structure. And then I can do what looks very much like JavaScript here. I have the fields with the dot notation, A, B, and C, two false goodbye. And then I can call modify that modify structure on that, that instance of example that I created. Modify structure S. If I do the thing, if I do that in JavaScript, I get two false goodbye because I've modified that instance of example. If I do the same thing in Go, I have the same problem I had with arrays. Nothing changed. <coughs> Data structures in Go by default pass by copy. They are copied into a function. They are not referenced by the function. So when I <coughs> created this S example here and passed it in, uh, it actually created a new copy of that inside the function for the function to modify, and then that, that, dis that structure just disappeared after the function ended. Uh, we're going to show how to get around this because it's important to get around this, but at the same time, this actually introduces uh, one of those aspects of functional programming that doesn't really exist in JavaScript, which is that uh, you have to be careful in JavaScript that you're not editing an object if you're doing a fully fun functional type program where something comes in that should be immutable and something goes out that should also be immutable, right? So uh, in, in Go, you can control that. If you don't want something to be passed into a function that, you, that should be um, modified by the function, you just specify a structure the way it is uh, and it will be copied. Now we're going to talk about how to get around that, because a lot of times you want to get around that. And that's what pointers are for. That's basically all that pointers do. 
So I don't know how familiar everyone is with them. They might have just it might just be a dirty word to you, um, or it might be something you've used a lot. But especially in Go, uh, their simplified pointer system is essentially used just to change something from cop from pass by copy to pass by reference. So we'll we'll just get into that. We'll show some examples. Um, but it's really not that bad. So I start with my boilerplate code. I'm on time. Oh, I'm almost done. I'm just going to get done with pointers. I'll run through pointers really quick. And we'll call it. So I'm going to create a vertex structure with an x, y value. Uh, so there are two float 64. It represents a point in space. That's that vertex. <clears throat> and then I'm going to create a new vertex and initialize it to 6 and 7. And then I'm going to create that modified vertex function, and I'm going to set the x value to negative 100. I'll then modify it with the modify function, and you know what's going to happen. It's not going to change. That's what we just saw before, right? Because the structure, this vertex, was passed in, it was copied, you edited a copy. We'll create another function called modify y. It does the same thing except for the y variable. And we're going to add this one little character right here in the function. And all of this character says is I want, a co I want a reference to it, not a copy of it. That's all the pointers say. So then I want to modify my, my vertex v here. But I have one issue, that it is not a pointer, it is an object. So I have to create a reference in order to pass a reference. And that's what the and symbol here is. It's create a reference to this vertex V, and then I can pass that in. What I get out is exactly what I wanted. I've recovered sanity. <laughs> I can now pass by reference. Until you forget the password. Until you forget the Yes, exactly. That's where the debugging goes crazy. So we'll do one really quick here. Um, I'm going to do a make vertex <coughs> function here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it an angle in degrees. I'm going, to I'm going to calculate the angle and radians. Then I'm going to basically initialize a vertex so that it is at, pointing at the angle or on the axis that that is. And then return that. So that's in the return type, this vertex, and I'm returning vertex. What's the problem? Any ideas? I'm returning a vertex here. I create a vertex here and then it gets copied on the way out, right? It's always passed by copy by default. So I just created a new vertex. If I do this and call it, I get a vertex out that's different. So what I want to do here is I created a new vertex. I might as well just pass a reference back to it. So I change that type to be, again, say that I want to pass a reference instead of just the object itself to be copied. And then I ask for a reference to that object instead of just the object itself. And then I have to change that here. And I can go on and, and do that. And that's basically all pointers are in Go. There's none of this pointer arithmetic junk you find in C. There's just none of that. They've dumped it all because it just creates problems. So I hope that, you, that the fact that there are pointers in this language doesn't scare you away from it, because they're actually pretty easy to get too used to once you get used to it. And that's all the time I have today, so if there's any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, thank you for coming. What software is that that's typing this up? Uh, it's called Code Tour. Uh, it's my own. I, I'm making it. I'm in the process of releasing it. Uh, it's not out yet. I'm going to release it in mid-March. Uh, no, you get to control it. So there's an editor where you can toggle the visibility and stuff and all that. It's like creating a little slideshow. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Anything else? Yes. This goes to support hoisting <coughs> the function and variables. Support what? Hoisting. Meaning? If you define it at the bottom rather than above where you call it, it'll just. Oh. Yeah, it's, take it's care a of compiled that. language. It doesn't care about the order. Cool. Um, everything is defined. To the bottom. Yep. Uh, it also has very strict uh, variable definitions. If you define a variable inside of a for loop, it doesn't exist outside of the for loop. So scoping is much more strict.
Um, it's been like two years since I've used Go, and the biggest problem that I had with it was there just isn't enough examples out there because not as many people use it. Uh -huh. that gotten better recently? I would say it's gotten a lot better. They've got a, there's a, uh, there's actually a site now called uh, play.golang.org. I don't know if that existed when you were doing it, but it's essentially just a whole bunch of examples for you to walk through and do that kind of stuff. Uh, they are, that was, a really big problem that they have been trying to address. I would say it's getting much better. It's certainly not JavaScript in terms of like being able to figure out everything. Um, I would say communication has gotten better between communities, Slack communities, that kind of stuff as well. So that is um, But the number of people doing it have, have been reaching in the last couple of years. So it's much better. On that same day, someone needs to build with the So the like, Golang has this play, and it'll actually, uh, if you go to, if you just Google search Golang, uh, they have a main site, which is basically like a tutorial that'll walk through, and this playground actually will run Go code in the browser, uh, so it's very easy to just kind of follow along and learn, and they'll do a lot of the stuff, kind of things that I showed today, uh, in a lot more detail. Uh, so it's an excellent resource to get started. Uh, they also have a blog, which they put a lot of, like really good information on, um, just to kind of how to use it and how to install it and all of that, um, which is fairly easy. To manage. So I was I was surprised. It was refreshingly easy to get going when I first started. Anything that's on? Go. Yes. All right. Oh. Sorry. Uh, where do you see it going mostly? Uh, it's really, I didn't get to the example today, unfortunately, because there's just too much to cover. Uh, it's really great for server backends because it's really good. So one of JavaScript's issues is uh, when you want to do a bunch of things at once, you have to define a whole bunch of promises, and those promises don't actually run all at the yeah. same time. They want to run after you, right? And so you have to use like web worker threads and all of that stuff. Um, Go has this really great thing, which is you create a function, and then if you put the keyword Go in front of the function, it basically means run that in parallel. <laughs> right? It's like that easy. Um, it has, if you're familiar at all with Erlang, it has the channel communication system for that to, to make all of that parallel stuff safe, which takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, but it's really excellent when you want to be doing a lot of stuff concurrently and, and, and kind of like different things in parallel. I'm pulling this here and downloading this and scraping this, putting it all together and putting it out. Uh, and so I think mostly what you're seeing it for is that kind of back end web application where you really want that kind of stuff and the horsepower. The other thing is it's, it's really, really fast. Uh, and so, you know, if you want to be a lot of a lot of data on the server, you can be good for that. So I would say those are the two biggest use cases right now. Anything else? All right, thank you very much.